Um, Karen, could you start with the roll call, please? Um, those present, uh, Bob Mason. You can just read them off if you want. Here. Okay. Freddie Vander. Hi. Here. Valerie Watts. And Matt Carpenter. Here. For those present. Okay. And that gets us a quorum. And then it looks like we have two other people here tonight. That would be Tom Pesimir and Councillor Roden. Minutes would be the first thing up. Everybody get an opportunity to review the minutes from December 16th. And I'm gonna go ahead and start my screen share so that I can figure it out anyway. Are you seeing minutes now? Yep. Perfect. So it's an action item. If uh, commissioners have already reviewed them, open to. Uh... I'll make a motion to approve them. Thank you, Matt. Do we have a second? Fred and Valerie, be, even though you were not at the December meeting, you are allowed to vote on them and make mo and move or second. Okay, then I'll second. Thanks, Fred. Uh, okay, all in favor of approving the minutes, um, stay silent. If you're opposed, please speak up. Wow, that worked really well. Minutes are approved. <laughs> Valerie, did you figure out how to unmute if we uh, need to hear from you? Yes. Okay, good. Just making sure. I, I knew that you got muted earlier. I just wanted to make sure you were able to unmute. Okay, uh, next we have visitor public comment. Is there anyone with uh, visitor or public comment tonight? And Karen says no. And no one else looks like they have anything to say. So we will move on to staff reports presentations and I do have statistics for you. So uh, traffic enforcement data is first up and you will see here that our enforcement numbers are still down. Um, and this is partially COVID related and partially winter related. Um, we have, uh, well today we actually brought our motorcycle back online for half a day, but we had our uh, motorcycle officer um, not on the road for several weeks uh, during this dangerous weather. Um, so that's reflected somewhat in these numbers. And then also COVID has uh, still kept us um, from doing as much selective enforcement as we have in the past. Any questions on traffic enforcement? Okay, gonna move on. Injury accidents uh, during the same time period. And uh, let me bounce back real quick. This time period is from December 14th through February 12th. That's what these statistics are for. Um, just before our last meeting until uh, just before this meeting. Um, so uh, injury traffic accidents, you can see we had one at Hoffman and Gun Club. And that was where a vehicle was trying to uh, evade getting hit by another and then ended up um, running into an oncoming car. And we did cite someone for careless driving there. And then at South 10th and E Street, a, a juvenile bicyclist ran a stop sign and ran into a car that was on 10th Street. Those are our only two injury accidents during the time period. Non-injury accidents during the time period, we had 13. And really, um, nothing out of the ordinary uh, with the exception of a couple that were um, actually uh, one was a I'll call it an overdose and the driver was arrested for DUI and another was a medical um, where a medical incident caused someone to crash and they got transported by ambulance. So these are the 13 um, 
non-injury accidents that we had during the period. So also a couple are weather related here. Uh, you'll see River Road Bridge um, was icy uh, and uh, Independence Highway. Um, those are both storm related. I'm sorry, was there a question that came up there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I noticed that three of those are Gun Club, Broad and Hoffman. Um, do we typically see that amount of collisions at Gun Club, Broad and Hoffman, like three in, I don't know, three um, months? I mean, not every couple months, but I think it's not unusual to see an accident at Gun Club, Broad and Hoffman. But I thought I only saw two. I don't know. Was there a third one there, Fred? I see one here. At the bottom. Then At there the was bottom. an injury one. Oh, there. oh, yeah, you're right. The injury one. You're right. There were three. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know exactly where we are on that intersection improvement. Um, it's been a little while since I've had an update there. Gotcha. But we are uh, in the midst of an intersection improvement there. Um, I believe that the intersection is going to get improved along with uh, pedestrian improvement um, as part of a grant that we um, got with the county. Yeah, I can, I can give a mini update on that. Um, uh, so Valerie, I don't think we've had the opportunity to meet, so um, it's good to see a picture of something on your screen, which isn't isn't you, but, but hello. Um, so, uh, oh, hi, Valerie. <laughs> yes, um, so uh, my understanding, just based on some really recent conversations we had uh, with the county is they are um, continuing on with the design process there. Um, they've kind of, haven't run into issues, but they've definitely um, been trying to figure out how to make the uh, pedestrian um, improvements uh, the best that they possibly can be working with uh, bike lanes as well as um, uh, sidewalks and trying to figure out whether they're going to combine those together. And I, I'm not really certain as to what they've determined, um, but they're still, I would say, fairly early on in the design process, at least from what I can see. So that project's got a lot slower than they had hoped. Um, there's been, they've had some issues, I think, with the consultant and just uh, with staffing on their side. Um, so I don't think you're gonna be seeing anything anytime real soon. Um, but, uh, you know, it's still our hope that they get that done this, this summer. Um, but I'm, I'm not super confident that, uh, that they're going to be able to get that done uh, before we run into to weather next year. So we'll have to, We'll have to wait and see how it goes. Obviously, they're in charge of the project, and we're so, we're certainly providing some input as they ask, um, and they have asked, reached out to us a couple times, and, then, and quite frankly, have done a good job of listening to our comments. But uh, it's definitely not not the quickest project that I've ever seen in the world. So, thank you for that update. And then the last uh, page of the uh, statistics reports is hit and runs uh, during this time period. And you will see that uh, the first one was uh, no suspects, second one driver arrested, third one driver arrested the next day, and then the last three we had no suspects or uh, ability to identify one. And that was it for uh, my presentation on statistics. The of Moving on on the agenda, we have action items and discussion items. And the first one is uh, Traffic Safety Commission position number one, which uh, has been vacated now by uh, Tim Hines. And we just wanted to uh, recognize Tim for serving nine years on this commission and thank him for his service. And in the same breath, kind of uh, ask if anyone has any ideas for a replacement for Tim's position and uh, encourage you to get that name to Karen if you do. Um, this is a appointed position by the mayor and council. And at this time, we don't have anyone in line for that position. Is that right, Karen? Still nobody that's uh, shown interest? Yeah, okay. So if anyone has some ideas on the Traffic Safety Commission, we do need uh, to fill a position there. Okay, next up, uh, we're gonna talk 
briefly about the parking code um, changes and uh, walk through the um, parts of them that we might want to look at to um, improve before we take them back to council. So I'm going to start. Um, and Councillor Roden, feel free to jump in here. I'm going to ask specifically um, where you think the concerns lie and then uh, help us uh, navigate how to maybe get a better product to bring back to council before we come back. Um, so first, I'll, I just have a couple of pictures here that uh, uh, Officer Albie took um, in the last few weeks on complaints that she had. Um, just looking for some examples of some of the problems that we're trying to address. And then I went out and just snapped a few of ones that I've had complaints about in the past. Um, just to get an idea of the types of things we're talking about. So those five pictures are just kind of a, a sample of uh, some of the concerns that we're hearing about um, regarding parking. So um, walking through the code changes, I don't believe that this section um, really had much concern uh, by council. This was just a definition section where we uh, define recreational vehicle. Um, so I'm gonna to bounce to the next slide. And here we uh, changed um, slightly the code to allow school buses and public transit to uh, be in a bike lane while picking up or dropping off passengers. I don't think that one was a concern. But we'll get to where I think the concerns lie here in just a minute. This one I don't think was a concern. It did get a fair amount of conversation. And this one was about um, the change that we did in the second revision um, where Councillor Hines had felt like we were in violation of the old language. Um, so this language actually comes right out of the motor vehicle code of the state of Oregon and is in place. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, Councillor Rhoda, did you feel like there was concerns on this section um, by council? Um, I felt that uh, Shannon Coor brought it up who just, um, and then I brought up, is it gonna change or parking in the downtown area with, if we change this to the 50 feet instead of 25 feet? And I was told it would not, is that correct? So yes. I think once we got past that, I think we were all in agreement. Okay, good. Then I'll get to the sections that I do think uh, are a little bit more concerning. Um, this one, I don't really think had um, any concerns and this was the specific uh, sizes of vehicles, restricting sizes. Uh, and we actually increased these sizes slightly uh, from what it was. However, before it said connected combination and this took that language away so that it was just any, um, anything that was all by itself out there as well as a connected combination. But I think the next slide is where the concerns lied mostly. Um, and that was where we said that a disconnected trailer by itself was gonna be against code. Um, recreational vehicles, except for loading and unloading. Storage containers without getting a permit and solid waste receptacles larger than 1.5 cubic yards uh, without first getting a permit. And I feel like this slide uh, really dem demonstrates where most of the concerns lie. Um, does that accurately represent how council kind of felt about it? I think so. I think we had a, a concern of uh, penalizing everybody for the few people who kind of take advantage of this situation. So I, I think a lot of us like um, the 48 hour rule that there was in there that people could park a vehicle or trailer in a certain spot for 48 hours but have to move it. And, um, and that was my concern too, because I, I just think of people with their trailers and, you know, small and businesses and stuff. Is there really a need to change that from 48 hours to a zero tolerance? Okay. Uh, what are other comments on that? Um, those that helped write the language, how do you feel about, well, and let me ask uh, Councilor Rudin, do you think that four and five had any concerns here? Um, the idea that dumpsters and 
um, like storage pods would have to. No, I think it's phase two and three that people had concerns about. Okay, and I thought that I just wanted to verify before I went on. Um, so with two and three, how do we feel about looking at some language that allows those items but puts a time restriction on them? Um, and I'll start off the issue. Um, quite honestly, if it had a time restriction on it, the only way we would generally enforce that is if we had a complaint or if it was a hazard. Um, we don't really go out and just randomly mark all vehicles. So knowing it's been there for two days doesn't really happen without people telling us um, generally. I mean, we do have an, an, a code officer that drives the town and looks for things, but really they're more often going to just respond to where they get complaints, which may work because people are complaining. So, you know, that may be a, a viable solution. Um, can I get other people's opinions on that? Well, I, I get what you're saying. I, I All I'm thinking about is even the two examples of the trailer on Ash Street um, or Ash Street Road, what, the one down by the storage unit. Seems like the absolute perfect place if you had to park a vehicle for a short period of time to do so. It's in front of a field, it's not really intruding on anybody's space. And it probably is a homeowner real close to there who probably needs that. And, and so and even for the trailers, I just can't, I would hope that people, that we wouldn't penalize the whole town to not be able to park their trailer disconnected in front of their house for a short period of time. Obviously, we don't want someone living in their trailer and being in the trailer for longer than 48 hours, but I think this is a pretty heavy duty restriction. Nobody else is going to say anything. I think having. Having, having, <laughs> having the 48 hour window, you know, at least gives people a chance to be able to do, do what they need to do with their trailers and still have their small businesses and park in front of their houses. And if it becomes a huge problem for a certain area of town, then hopefully people would complain and we would get code enforcement out there. Well, I think as far as the time period goes, it's a matter of safety, isn't it? Well, it even if they're, if they're illegally parked, they're illegally parked. But if they're just a trailer in front of someone's house and they're within, you know, they're not obstructing traffic, then it shouldn't be. If safety was the issue, then of course I would be for it. But this is just having a vehicle parked in a safe manner on the road, correct? Yes, I'm going to say generally that's true. Um, yes. Yeah, because if it was, I mean, other statutes would fall into place, um, like some that we've even looked at here, if it was causing uh, a traffic hazard, there would be other ways to address it, other than it just being a trailer. Yes. And I think some of those, I mean, with that previous slide where it says that a uh, disconnected vehicle greater than 24 feet long, that's going to limit anyway a lot of those bigger, like you were saying, the trucks and things. It will limit those just based on size alone. So, so if two and three were to go away or come back with a time period attached, you think that would be more amenable to council? I think so. Okay. But if we go back to that, I mean, most travel trailers, aren't they larger than 24 feet? So would that? I don't know about most. I, I, certainly some are. Mine is. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is. <Yeah. laughs> but I, I, now there's a lot of smaller ones out there. Um, certainly. They've become popular, the smaller ones. Well, I, I mean, I am kind of th uh, thinking of people with their travel trailers and recreational vehicles for a short period of time and rv parked out there would be greater than 24 feet easy peasy but yeah um i think that goes back to i was trying to find it here um where we didn't 
well, no, that isn't it. That's just the definition. I apologize. Where we didn't put a timeline on it specifically, but said the loading and unloading was permitted. Yeah. Um, I guess that's just my concern. Obviously, it would it wouldn't affect me because I I never park on the street, but. I just feel for people who use the storage facility and bring their trailer down and park their trailer in front of their home to go on a hunting trip or whatever they do. And, and it's longer than 24 feet. I don't like to break the rules and I'm sure a lot of people in town don't like to break the rules either. So I think just having some leniency with that is, is great. Right. I think that that leniency, um, and I'll, I, I believe that that's built into number three there because it says except for loading and unloading. And we had put that timeline on there, but the city attorney really discouraged us from that because then people who don't live there that aren't just bringing it home to load it and unload it, if it says you can park for 48 hours on the street, they just have to find a different place in town to park for 48 hours. And then they move to another place in town for 48 hours. And before long, they're just moving around town. And that was what I think she was telling us they've struggled with in other locations and trying to discourage us from doing. But isn't it written in the code too that a, like a travel trailer cannot be disconnected? So you can't have a disconnected trailer in front of your house even for loading and unloading, correct? Um, no, because it would fit under the definition of recreational vehicle. And it says in three here that a recreational vehicle can be in front of your house for loading and unloading. Okay, so I thought I read somewhere else where it had to be attached to the, um, like the truck. That's our current code. Okay. Yeah, current code. That's correct. So maybe from what I'm hearing you say, um, the recreational vehicle piece may not be an issue as much as number two, just disconnected trailers in general, which would, give you all of your um, utility trailers and, and smaller trailers that people often leave in front of their homes um, for convenience when they're doing work and things. Yeah. Well, I know there's issues around town. I mean, there's, I think it's down Marigold that there's limousines parked up and down that street and, you know, they use for their business. But again, I, I mean, it's obviously up to the traffic safety, but Seems like I just don't see there's a huge problem with it to not have a, a time a time limit on it. The 48 hours, you think yeah. it's not, you don't believe it will be a problem where people just keep driving through town. I mean, and we haven't seen that much. There's only been a few of those people in our town where they just live out of their trailer and move about town the whole time. Yeah, I've seen them. I mean, I, I know one specifically that drives at least in my neighborhood and parks and and it's annoying but again i don't want to penalize the whole community for the acts of one or two groups of people that's that's right i and i think we're saying the same thing i think that maybe you're you and rightfully you're concerned that the discretion of except for loading and unloading may mean less than 48 hours and that would not be our intent um i would say that I mean, I'm a trailer owner and I'll tell you my intent for loading and unloading is a couple days uh, both ways. And that's why we had 48 hours in the original code. But by putting that in there, you then kind of create a permission for people to move about town and not just load and unload, if that makes sense. Okay, I think uh, any other comments on that? I think I have um, a good idea of where to go next. Um, if no one else has comments. And I'm not seeing any. So let's see. F Street Bridge Design is up next. Um, Mr. Pessimer, did you want me to bring your photos up or did you want to take control? And you're muted. I will go ahead and try to share mine. So um, if you want to give me, just uh, stop sharing your screen, give me a second here to get organized. I'm having some. So maybe give me another second. Um, all right, so I 
All right. Hopefully everybody can see uh, the F Street Bridge uh, information on their screen. So I'm not certain how much uh, information uh, everyone has about the F Street Bridge project. So I'm going to kind of do just a little bit of background um, conversation first, and then we'll kind of get into what we're hoping to, to talk about tonight, which is really just kind of getting some feedback on a couple of different options for picking the railing and some of the lighting options for the bridge. Um, currently, we haven't really uh, done much there. I, I know it's been talked about, um, and I know that uh, there was definitely some interest uh, uh, expressed by Traffic Safety Commission and, and uh, Kai um, Kadam, uh, uh, our former public works director, kind of um, outlined uh, that he was going to bring it back. So really, this is that presentation that he talked about before. Um, and for those of you who might not know, uh, Kai uh, isn't uh, with the city any longer. So um, I'm kind of filling in as the acting public works director, and we're kind of just uh, helping each other out so we we get someone um, someone back in that position. So um, just kind of briefly um, looking at. Uh, the F Street Bridge, this is kind of what it is uh, currently in all of its uh, glory. Um, and obviously no sidewalks, uh, very narrow. It's a timber structure underneath and uh, you can see the weight limit is at seven tons, which is not very much um, for, for a bridge. Um, I live down a road and it's a timber structure bridge and it's rated still at uh, 20 tons and they've, they've lowered it because of the uh, restrictions there. So um, certainly uh, a bridge that is um, uh, on a road that uh, would probably get a lot more traffic if uh, this was in better uh, shape. It's certainly a problem for the fire department um, to uh, utilize it. And so the city made an application to ODOT to get some significant grant funding to actually uh, replace this bridge. So the plan is to um, uh, replace the bridge with something that actually uh, will meet um, load standards as well as to access for for vehicles and pedestrians and, and bikes. And so you're going to see um, this uh, get wider. There'll be bike uh, lanes, uh, or excuse me, pedestrian um, sidewalks on both sides. Uh, I believe there's uh, bike lanes at least on one side, if not both sides. Uh, Fred can correct me. Um, but certainly this is going to get wider. Um, and still, and then be more um, usable for for the long term. Uh, but I don't really have a whole lot of plans to show you, or at least renderings. I have a whole lot of CAD drawings, but uh, I don't really. That probably won't help too much. So it, it is a fairly short span. It crosses um, the South Fork of Ash Creek, um, and it is uh, a project that. Um, uh, really needs to get done. We have uh, another project that's high on the list, which is a gun club, gun club road bridge. Um, and so, you know, we'll probably be chasing funding for that um, as, as our next project. But this is the one that was uh, chosen to, to improve at this point in time. So the question has come up um, about, okay, well, what should we do for the aesthetics of the um, the bridge uh, railings, as well as the lights. And I think the question probably immediately jumps to most people's uh, mind on the commission is, well, why is this before the Traffic Safety Commission? And, uh, and, and the answer to that is really because uh, there really isn't a whole lot of other places we can go. Um, the only other place that we talked about potentially getting some feedback was going to uh, the Parks uh, Board. Um, but, you know, I, I think at least uh, when Kai was here, the thinking was, well, let's at least get some feedback um, and make sure that we're on the right path before we just make a unilateral decision and, and move forward. Um, with that said, uh, the design of the bridge is currently being held up um, by uh, needing to make a decision here. So um, it is important that we move this forward uh, quickly. So hopefully we can get some kind of indications from uh, everybody here tonight and kind of uh, make this some decisions and move forward. Uh, but if not, we'll we'll take whatever process we need to do in order to get there. So, um, uh, 
questions before I move on to kind of the different options? So um, A through G view um, some different uh, uh, really aesthetics. Um, they will all uh, meet um, safety rules as far as you know preventing cars from uh, going into the creek or whether they run off the road or um, pedestrian uh, safety. So clearly we wouldn't present anything to you that did the requirements, although I will mention there is one option in here that that barely meets the requirements. So um, that uh, it would be something to consider. So this is kind of the base option, uh, the lowest $200 per linear foot. There's about, about a $42,000 um, total. This is really a basic standard rail. You see this all over the place because it's the cheapest. Um, and uh, that is something that, uh, um, you know, is not super appealing, but certainly uh, does its job to uh, protect uh, uh, passenger or pedestrian and vehicle safety. Um, I will mention we do have a, a somewhat of budget constraints because we have to stay with inside of what we propose ODOT for the total project in general. We can't run over on any one particular item, um, but certainly $2,000, uh, it isn't you know a huge portion of the budget for the project. So that is one potential option. Um, this is the other option. This is, um, I believe on Highway 51, if I'm correct on the uh, Ash Creek as well, um, kind of as it comes into to downtown. And this is a really historic steel handrail. You've probably seen this a lot. This is the one that barely meets um, code for vehicles because they can certainly, if they get going fast enough, can end up uh, careening through one of those gaps. Those concrete pillars are actually pretty stout. So they tried to, you know, uh, deflect uh, things. But um, this is another look. It is uh, about $260 per linear foot. So I think that's about 38% uh, more total cost, about $55,000 for the project. Um, so that is another option. And I'll go back through all these options and when we get done, so you guys can kind of compare and, and give give your feedback um, as to what you think. Uh, this is the same price. Uh, this is, um, I believe, it's, I don't remember where this is. It's in Albany. Uh, so um, this is a uh, concrete parapet with a historic steel rail. So you can kind of see they're kind of combining uh, methods here, keeping that steel look on top for aesthetic purposes, but putting something more substantial underneath it. So uh, it uh, ends up uh, providing a better uh, protection for vehicles. Um, last thing you want to do in a vehicle is go over the edge and into a creek. Um, so that is another example. Here is the same example, um, and, uh, the, pretty much the same. Uh, the only thing is, is that uh, uh, steel portion is painted black, um, probably actually um, coated in black, so it would uh, Well, I think we lost uh, Mr. Pesimir. His audio wasn't really good, was it? Yeah, I was having problems too, but the the uh, images at least were coming through. We'll see if he rejoins here in a moment. Well, we've got a break into action. Uh, let me announce just the fact that um, as part of our transportation system plan, um, we are having some public outreach coming up here. Um, so just, um, be aware of that folks, um, also like help spread the word. We're going to have a virtual open house from February 22nd to March 8th. So people can just top on the website, www.independencetsp.com and they can, um, interact with that information. 
There's going to be a YouTube live event on March 3rd at 6. Just go to the city's YouTube page uh, and you can join that. And also there's going to be a presentation um, before the city council, I think on the next council meeting. So, uh, and the planning commission will be at that. So, so anyways, um, there is going to be a whole bunch of stuff about the transportation system plan update. I mean, what Tom's talking about that F street bridge, it's sort of becomes really important into the larger sort of system when you when you consider it system-wide and our lack of connectivity west and east through the town the f street bit, bridge is a big deal um so i guess um uh, yeah that just trying to <laughs> fill up the time in an effective way i suppose so well he's back so uh perfect i am back sorry about that my uh my router decided to reset itself so did, uh, where did you guys lose me? So did we get to this slide before I kind of just disappeared from life? Yeah. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so really this is essentially the same as the one before, um, except it is just painted black. So it, it or it is coated in black. So um, definitely a better look. Uh, this is kind of what we as staff kind of were thinking was kind of the best option just from a cost um, to uh, aesthetics look. Um, but certainly, you know, we want, uh, we want feedback on that. Um, another option is this Texas rail, uh, and we're just giving you lots of different ideas here. Um, I'm not a particular fan of this one. Uh, it certainly is something that, uh, is possible. Um, it is a little bit more expensive at $275 a linear foot or about $58,000 total, but really only about $3,000 more than, um, what the other option was. There is another uh, Texas Rail option, which is rectangular rather than the kind of arched um, look. Uh, same price as the other one, and um, that is definitely a look if it appeals to you. And then um, one of the things that kind of came up from the design team was it was really kind of based on a conversation about the ginkgo tree uh, that we got from Hiroshima that is in uh, the uh, Inspiration Garden. And so this is a option that comes out of um, Hiroshima, uh, of a different type of bridge rail. Um, it is uh, for quite a bit more expensive at uh, $350 per linear foot, so $74,000 total. Um, so that's about a, a $20,000 difference over um, like the Texas rail um, and uh, uh, quite a bit more than just your, your basic option. Um, and we actually did a rendering of that so you could kind of see what that would look like. This is actually uh, the creek itself or the bridge crossing itself. So um, at least the background is and you can kind of see what that rail would look like. And I think that was kind of the second recommendation if we wanted to spend a little bit more money. Um, I think the tie, you know, to Hiroshima and the tree is, is uh, you know, kind of loose because that's really not a Japanese uh, garden or um, anything like that. But you know, it, it is definitely uh, an option for consideration. So those were really the ones that uh, the consultants looked at and kind of gave us uh, information on. Um, I, I think that all of them are probably within reason for costs for um, the project. One additional alternative that we don't really have any renderings for, but it would be uh, this type of uh, a concept with um, some, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but it would have uh, some uh, cutouts here, you know, some decorative cutouts, probably just, you know, uh, pressed in to give it a little bit more relief down in here. Obviously, that would raise the cost. Uh, they actually did make a recommendation, one more that I didn't actually put in here uh, for some reason, which had, you know, like rock and stuff uh, filling in this in here, but um, that was getting, you know, kind of a uh, kind of uh, expensive and and I'm not sure what the look of that would be like. So with that said, I'm just going to turn it over to you guys and let you give, guys give some feedback of what you liked and I'd be happy to go through each of these again and you guys can just tell me what you say. I kind of like the idea of pressing in designs though. I could see kids going out there and doing that. 
Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead Tom. Man. No, oh, go I ahead. would. I would probably pick D. Um. I kind of like the looks of the concrete ones, but I kind of have a dog in the fight because maintenance, concrete is porous, spray paint is hard to get out of concrete. So for me personally, the less concrete, the better, but the, the figure that you're on with you saying that it may be compromised, I don't know that that one would be the one. So I would probably say D, I think it was. Yeah. That's yeah. a lot of concrete, though. It is. But, and I don't want to poo poo on this one too much because obviously our consultant would not recommend anything that didn't meet current standards. Um, okay. So uh, it is a short crossing. Um, and so, certainly, you know, if this is something that you like, I guess your, you know, the choice would really be do you want it in green or blue or black, excuse me, not blue. <laughs> Can I say something or do I remain quiet here? Uh, Councillor, I, I would welcome your input on this actually. So, I mean, normally council liaisons are going to just uh, mostly listen and talk about council opinions, but I, the more input we get, the better off we are. So, so I, I, I need to be taught, so I appreciate you your leniency with this. But if you go to, the, I think it's figure one, is it figure one or two, the very first one? I, I'm sorry, this one right here. This is what we have throughout the town on most of our side streets currently. And this um, F Street does have, it, it is in a residential area, but it does go down to an industrial area too. I'm thinking just as the city of Independence, if we were looking at Gun Club Road, I can see it's going more fancy with our bridge design. But I think having this, this pattern uh, not only is, economically the best option but it also already matches what we have throughout the town on our um side streets and i think they're great so this is the one i would lean to because i it matches what we already have it's not a huge uh it's not a a, a road that everybody will travel like gun club is a is a major thoroughfare through our town so i could see us spending more money on a decorative bridge there but i don't see us spending a lot of money on this one okay. um and so really in independence unless i'm missing something we really we only have a couple of bridges uh fred correct me if i'm wrong and i think we have this, you're absolutely right, is a example of one, and this is an example of the other. So um, those are kind of the, the two that we typically have. Uh, and you're right, there's a difference of about, uh, what, uh, $13,000 or so uh, between the two. Um, well, style B is what's on 16th Street. Yeah, that's Monmouth, though. Oh, yeah, that's true. Any other thoughts or input? I, uh, I tend to think that if we're going to, I mean, we don't get the opportunity to build bridges very often. Um, you know, this is something that's funded, being funded by the state. I'm not saying let's go crazy, but I mean, let's design this thing. Uh, as something that we're going to be proud of, um, you know, in, yeah. in 20 years. So uh, personally, I would say, yeah, B or, B or D, I think, um, are, are the two options that I like the most. Um, I, I tend to like figure B, uh, figure B more um, just because I, I don't know, I, li I like it more. I think I'd like it even more if it had a couple of lights um, similar mm -hmm. to downtown included in it. Um, that's one thing that I like about D. But yeah, I think um, uh, I, I completely understand what Council Member Roden's saying that not a whole lot of people that drive this road right now. But again, uh, you know, the southwest portion of the community is growing 
Um, right now, we might not see the traffic on this road that um, that it will have. And so I think sort of anticipating um, the growth of this area and just like designing something, yeah, that we can be proud of. I think that's what we should aspire to here. I agree 100%. Yeah, and uh, S3, you know, it will become a fairly important east-west connector since we're so um, light on uh, connectors. And, you know, it's one of the strategies to move um, some of the traffic off of the intersection uh, or 7th Street in particular. So, um, so uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think um, like I said, none of these are going to break the bank, but certainly we should be, cost is a, is a part of it. So, we include it. So I'm not hearing any Texas tombstone shaped things here. I'm not hearing any of this other Texas rail or the tie to Hiroshima. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on those or that we just, uh, we should we just throw those out? I'd say throw it out and I'm with Matt on anything we can do to mitigate graffiti in the future we should think about with this structure because yeah there has been graffiti problems on our bridges so. okay well they're also definitely more expensive too so um so i think uh i think uh we can definitely throw those throw the, unless somebody has strong thought. i have a question tom so a lot of um the municipal stuff around gresham a lot of their porous like pump stations and stuff, they have a product that they spray on. It's called Graffiti X. I don't know if that worked good for them. It's one of the requirements for their municipal stuff. I don't know if the concrete portions of this, we could get that on there. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain we could. Um, I don't know if we can, if the state will pay for that. Um, that's certainly a question we can ask and it's a good question. Um, it certainly helps. Uh, I definitely know um, that it's not the end all for graffiti, but yeah. uh, for for those uh, taggers, you just go to the local hardware store and buy your your standard paint. Um, it does work uh, fairly well, so at least yeah. makes it clean up easier. So yeah, okay. So the one with the um, uh, the Jersey barrier looking. At thing at the bottom of number D is that actually uh or letter D is that actually does that go straight up Tom or I guess um is it is it is it like a jersey barrier does it kind of slope up at an angle no that's another picture of exactly the same one the uh, rail just a different color uh, it's gotcha. pretty vertical I think there is a little bit of a taper to it but it's it's very minor Gotcha. And you don't want much of a taper there because that encourages cars to actually ramp up on it and go over the side. So, gotcha. I I kind of like the black rendering on D, um, especially anything we can do to kind of connect this to Inspiration Gardens and that whole walking mm -hmm. path that's gonna that already goes all the way from F Street to about as far as you can go south in the new buildings there. Um, you know, tying it together and making it look nice is going to be important to encourage people to come out and walk it and yep. uh, enjoy it. So, now I've heard kind of the two that I've heard the most about are A and B. If uh, B was black, uh, Chief, would that kind of get you to the same place? Or do you still like D? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I like D. I just like the, yeah, the aesthetics of it. I mean, the park is really nice and it, it gets better every year. And the nicer this looks, yeah. the more it draws people um, to that. And this is all going to tie right into the entrance to that park. So, yeah. People is just minutes away right here on Fox. Okay. All right. Well, I, I didn't expect, you know, um everybody to have the same feelings uh but definitely wanted to get some input so um we'll uh, kind of move on unless anybody else has any other thoughts this is something that if we decide on tonight we can get started on i just i don't want to 
I don't want to be the lone voice that puts us off two months. I mean, I can totally compromise. I just yeah. I mean, based on the comments that I've heard tonight, if I were to tell the consultant what to do, I probably would tell them to go with B in black, um, just because of Matt's comments with Valerie, uh, and and it's it's just slightly more expensive than than this option. I also think that that open look, especially in that area with the creek, um, being able to see through there and trying to really encourage pedestrian and bicycle traffic through there is probably going to be be a great amenity so people can actually have more of a view of the of the landscape as they as they go through that area. But does anybody have any concerns if we just do that? I think if the railings are in black, it will kind of uh, blend in with the scenery. You'll be able to see the scenery in a more clear way than just having these gray bars going across that's what you said right in black yeah black or green yeah, yeah but yeah. black and i don't black, want to sound uh, hypocritical but i i agree with fred on the on the light i, I guess if you're going to go pretty you might as well have a couple pretty lights well why don't we talk about lights then so um so we have some different lighting options to take a look at. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I think the considerations here, the, the cost difference between the lights is negligible. There's only two lights that they're proposing for the project. So, um, you know, and, and most of the cost is in the, at least on a bridge, not, not your regular light, but when you're on a bridge, most of the cost is really in tying it into the structure um and everything else so uh you know some of the lights that we have in downtown are you know uh multiple times more expensive than your regular uh, cobra head light that you could put on a on a wood or steel pole um but when you get to a bridge uh, option um, at least what we saw from the consultant was the, the cost didn't vary very much so um i don't think there'll really be much cost considerations here you're talking about a difference of two or four thousand dollars um, no matter what you do um, but I do think the considering the surrounding property is a natural area, at least is a concern for me, um, because uh, as we go through these, um, that is a pretty, uh, pretty loose rural area now. And we have inspiration card on one side and you have the creek on uh, there. My guess is that may fill in someday, uh, but you also have that large industrial piece of property that Council Road mentioned um, and we listened to this as well. So. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through these. So we have a, uh, a few different options to take a look at here. Um, you can give me your thoughts. Um, I added actually another one because I'm really concerned about putting acorn or globe type lights out there and spilling light um, all over the place. Uh, I don't know that that is out in this area um, a great idea, but that's uh, mostly what uh, was suggested moving forward. So. If we, here's a couple of options um, that uh, the consultant put together. They're about $14,000 per poll. We have two polls, as I mentioned, on the product. So you're looking at $28,000. Um, oh, and by the way, here is that other rail that uh, I neglected to put in um, before. And so that kind of has those inset um, criteria below on the concrete. Um, so hopefully nobody says, oh no, I really want that. And, Changes their mind. Um, but uh, here's a couple of different options. There's no real examples of this around town, but I will say that we probably could pretty much do um, a lot of different things uh, if, if the cost of the pole isn't really that uh, critical. Um, you could certainly change that gooseneck on the one to be more of a straight arm, that cur curly Q arm on the one on the left there is, is, uh, is pretty fancy. Um, but those are a couple of, of spots that they had. We could go with just your standard steel um, Cobra light. That would actually probably be the best from a lighting perspective because you can go a little bit higher. Um, you can uh, spill the light out a little bit further. Um, I think with this bridge, it probably will be underlit a little bit. I mean, it'll be certainly enough for traffic and 
pedestrians, but if you wanted, if it was, if it had more urban setting around it, you probably would want to put, you know, four lights on it rather than two. And certainly uh, cover lights are the best uh, for, for getting light out there just because you can easily make them taller. Um, and although you have considerations on the bridge because of the structural that goes with it. Um, but again, they, they said the price of these was just about the same. Uh, but those are a pretty industrial uh, looking light. Um, this is the one that I added. Obviously, this is a much taller version of what would uh, end up going out there, but it kind of just shows a more simple light. Um, I guess where I was really going with this isn't so much the pole, but the uh, actual light head on top. So it's not spilling light all over the place. Um, and it's actually focused down on the road in the pedestrian area, not uh, going into the creek. Um, and uh, uh, traveling a long ways, which is what you get with acorn light. Um, these are what we have in downtown Monmouth and Independence are similar. Uh, we have two, they have one. Um, like I'm not even gonna go there. Um, but, uh, but this is kind of the light that we have in downtown. Uh, they said it was about the same price, but I happen to know that even just a standard installation needs is about $18,000 pole so this would definitely be a little bit more expensive but it would match uh, what we have in in areas of town um, to put on the bridge so this is uh what uh another example of just a more of a concrete post um another ornamental acorn light um on a bridge and so those are kind of the options that they gave um so I'm going to open it up again for your guys' thoughts. I don't live down there, but I have heard from people that have residences and, you know, bedroom windows that are near these lights, and they would very much appreciate the option you came up with, I'm sure, to keep that light focused down instead of out. Um, I know there was some, some concerns about that uh, earlier. Yeah. <laughs> And I think light number 17 would be become target practice. <laughs> That's my concern too. I was just gonna ask how easily damaged these are because this is a road that isn't, um, isn't as populated and you know having target practice might be a little easier on this road. But I think the ones that you picked out Tom with the downcasting light are actually beautiful and would match kind of the black that you have wanting on the bridge yeah and i just wanted to go back to this because it shows uh, kind of what the the chief was talking about there's this black section here where the bridge is where there isn't any light but there's some cobra lights on i believe either side of the bridge although i think on the side where the picture is being taken from there are there are ways down the road um but yeah certainly uh there isn't a whole lot there now so we would definitely be adding but going back to this is target practice, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess, and to answer your question, Councilor Roden, I mean, we don't really have a whole lot of damage to poles um, and stuff, uh, but certainly, you know, the more remote it is, uh, the more pro problematic it is. Um, and so uh, this is, you know, a pretty, Standard look, um, and I, you know, I just my previous position in Sherwood. Boy, we had light conversations um, over and over and over and over again, and we ended up going with a similar light to this, just because mm -hmm. we had so many issues and so many complaints with those um, with the acorn type lights uh, in in areas uh, residential areas. Um, and particular. like the chief, like the chief mentioned about the light, you know, bothering neighbors. This one has a more concentration of light downward instead of outward. Yeah, it does not do as good of a job as coverage, so uh, that will be something we need to talk to the consultant about. But um, it, uh, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a. It's a relatively inexpensive um, option compared to what those lights in downtown are at $18,000 a piece. Um, like I said, for a bridge, it doesn't matter that much, but if you're gonna put lights in um, in your town, these would probably be less than half the cost of 
putting those uh, those fancy um, uh, decorative lights in. So. I'm guessing nobody wants these. Mm -hmm. And I, anybody have a love for either one of these? Well, I do know that bridge in Olympia. Uh, I mean, I I was in Olympia when they put that bridge in. I know I know exactly what bridge that is. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I no particular love for those. I mean, I I would. I mean, I guess the one thing that I I would just sort of say is, you know, some more detailing. Those those ones that um, that you've uh, included, I like them. Uh, you know, I like that they're shielded and directed downward. I think I'd just like a little more detailing on the on the pole. You know, that's like a pretty sleek looking pole right there, and just something that kind of mirrored what we got in downtown or at least sort of maybe a nod to to what's in downtown but like an interpretation of it for a shielded and directed downward light i feel like that would be a a cool thing how, i got a question how structurally sound are those in high wind and how tall is that well that one's very tall it would this would definitely be more on the order of what they're showing um here they would definitely be shorter uh, but I think Fred makes a great point. I just picked out an example, one that I could find, but you can, you can get, um, uh, many, many different types of the way these come is you, you buy the, the pole separate from the mast arm, separate from the light, separate from the base. Oh. And they have a lot of different options as to how the fluting on the pole goes and all those things. So I think Fred makes a great point. You know, we could certainly pick something that's going to cost exactly the same that might um, match a little bit more and, and tie into to what you have downtown, but still respect the, the, the area that you have, um, as well as the base too. I mean, they that base um, that they have for downtown is a little, well, actually it's, it's not that large, but a lot of times they make this size and then they make a smaller size as well, um, specifically for bridge type purposes and stuff for a smaller pole, so. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for indulging us and, and helping out. Um, and unless anybody feels strongly differently, we'll, we'll let the consultant kind of run with that and, um, and, uh, and we'll get this project uh, moving and done and, and uh, completed because uh, it's, uh, it's, it is going to be um, over time an important connection. And, um, you know, I know Councillor uh, Roden brought up uh, the, the issue of um, 7th Street and Monmouth Street um, at the council um, priority setting meeting. And certainly if we can redirect traffic um, to other streets, um, BF Street or other streets, and get them to go to different intersections on, on Monmouth Street until we actually get the Southern Arterial and other connections out to uh, other areas, we can uh, certainly work on providing some relief out there. So we're really excited to get this, this project uh, done and finished, so. All right, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and let the chief let you continue. Very good, thank you. So next up is a speed bump request that came in from a citizen through IndieWorks. And this person is wanting a speed bump um, on Marigold and Morning Glory. Oh, yeah. And we, you'll remember we had a, a, well, I don't know that it was a complete proposal, but we had a good discussion um, about speed bumps and perhaps a program um, for speed bumps. But that was with Kai and that went with Kai. Um, I would like to wait until a new public works director is in place to talk to them about speed bumps and how they feel about speed bumps. And it really needs to be a, a thought out process and when, when they're appropriate and when they're not so that we have some fairness to it. 
So I would like to push this off if everyone is good with that until we have a public works director to uh, kind of weigh in on how they feel about speed bumps. Cause there's a lot of different thoughts and ideas out there about them. Yeah, I'll mention there's probably gonna be a section in the transportation system plan that covers um, the traffic control devices and it'll it'll have a lot of other options in there other than just speed bumps uh, for traffic calming and for, for other things. That's pretty standard for a TSP and Fred could comment um, if that's gonna be in there or not, but I'm used to seeing those in probably pretty much every transportation system plan that's done. Um, so it'll talk about traffic calming um, from a higher perspective, and then that that kind of folds down into a conversation. Fred, is that gonna is that gonna be there? Do you know or? Yeah, I I know that it's there to some degree, and I do also know that um, um, uh, like I keep on looking at this road as you know um, a potential. I there we keep on showing it as a potential bike connection to ultimate and it was in our open uh, park and open space plan to somehow connect the end of Marigold um, sort of maybe north of the wastewater uh, treatment ponds over to eventually to get to highway 51 um, via Williams and all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, it, we've been sort of looking at that idea still. And if we did something like that, then, um, then I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're one of the things we would need to figure out is how exactly to, you know, really make Marigold a nice bike friendly street, bike and ped friendly street. As you know, um, our school kids have to um, they do not get bust if they're within a mile of the schools and that whole neighborhood there, the Morning Glory Marigold um, uh, neighborhood, they go to Ash Creek Elementary. So all of those kids have the potential to walk to school. In fact, they can't be bused to school and it'd be nice to give them a safe way to, to ride a bike or, or whatever there. And, you know, ultimately, I think that Morning Glory uh, Marigold, is, or well, Marigold especially, is like the the main way that you could do that unless there's another option that I just haven't seen but so yeah I think we are really looking specifically at that street but then also looking larger at the city at like you know how do you how do you uh, make some of these how, how do you have speeds on some of these streets that make it comfortable for for people of all ages to travel on them and uh, say an elderly scooter or a bicycle or whatever, you know, uh, so yeah. Okay, well that helps. I think uh, we will get back to this person and let them know that there are other things in the works and invite them to participate in the transportation system plan. Mm -hmm. How's that sound, Fred? Sounds great. All right, next we have a request to look at this alley. This is 240 Monmouth Street. And uh, the concern here is cars are blocking the alley um, when they are picking up from um, either Parallel 45 or the new food truck. So Fred went out and took a couple pictures today and I will show you those and then I'll let Fred talk about some ideas he had. Okay, Lawrence, here we go, guys. Here are the clues. Fred? Right, so I went out and I looked at this and um, basically you can see from this image right here where the alley starts. So the alley starts a ways west of the existing or of the existing parallel 45. You can see if you look at um, um, the uh, independent station building, you can see the edge of that right there is the alley. And so if you sort of drew that line out this way, you could see that, yeah, the alley is essentially right there. That power pole that you see on the right is actually in the alley. And so, um, so I mean, there's just a couple ideas that I had um, that you that we could potentially do to help this this person out. One thing I, I did is I definitely reached out to the food truck and said, hey, can you keep an eye out on the alley and make sure that no one's blocking that that parking area as they're picking up food. And they said that they would be willing to do that. Another just simple idea is 
um, work with uh, the uh, building owner, Parallel 45, to actually paint their parking and actually uh, sort of distinguish where the parking is versus where the drive lane is because it's kind of it's kind of confusing right now. Also, you know, just an idea too is just some simple like hey, some sort of paint on the concrete that says, um, you know, drive lane keep open or something like that or lane keep lane open or something like that. But I really do think that just even defining the parking spots would help def define where people can park um, vers versus not. So I think that let's ultimately start with um, the business owner and see if we can address the issue through that way is what I would recommend. The other thing, I, I'm sure everybody knows this, but this has been a one-way alley for a long, it was a one-way alley for a long time when the independent city hall was down there and the police department was down there, it was one way. So I think, is it being used as a one-way still or is it a two-way alley? It's still a one-way alley. It's just, it doesn't like have a one-way sign at the entrance, but there is a do not enter sign on the other side. Mm -hmm. So, so, it's uh, it's like back here. They yeah, do not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So maybe we could distinguish that too, because I mean, because isn't it coming towards us right now? The one-way direction, right? So all these cars must have gone in the wrong way. Is that correct? Uh, no, we changed the no. opposite. Direction. The opposite. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the proper way is the way these cars are parked now and then there's a do not enter mm -hmm. sign so they're not supposed to come out this way okay. and then just to the right of that corner is a huge parking lot yeah <laughs> good point but you can't enter the right. business from back there so oh. what about that driveway this driveway to the left that was the yeah is that i think they were there's, That's yeah because the cars parked there they can't get out of there that That's was true. really the complaint. Ah. Uh, that makes yeah, there's sense. A house. There's a house right there. That's their driveway. Yeah, and that was the complaint. And so the question was how do we how do we make sure that people know that um and to to keep that open? And so I mean that that's really what's driving this issue. Yeah, when, when this was the police department, because this was the police department, mm -hmm. uh, I think you could still see a line right here, a painted line. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of defines the edge of the alley right there, um, where we were trying to keep our cars out of it. So I agree with your ideas, Fred. I think that that could probably, those simple things could help solve the problem. Um, how do you feel about the, the fact that the shrubs are intruding? Oops, went the wrong way there, sorry. So far in. Oh, Two feet. <laughs> yeah. Three feet. Yeah. yeah, no, they're definitely they're definitely um, coming out quite a bit. I mean, one idea that the one place where I thought that you could maybe put a sign is on that that power pole and that you sort of see at the, the edge of that. And you know, I, I got looking at that picture there and I realized there's nothing attached to that power pole right now. It's just a pulse sitting there like there's no power run into it that meter that you kind of see it on it has been pulled and moved so that pole right now is not being used for anything and so the the one idea that i had if you did want to put up a sign is you could trim back that hedge a little bit and just say um you know no parking in alley on on that pole but that that was about the only idea for a sign or anything that i could think of when I was looking at it. Well, I think Parallel 45 should just put up their own no parking signs right there on that on that side of the building. Maybe that would help. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a problem for them to park in this diagonal parking as long as they're parking in it. I think the complaint we were getting was people are actually stopping in the alley. And right. Yeah. When, those, when those spots fill up, they park on the other side to stop and pick up their food. I see what you're right. saying. So for pickup, maybe those should be pickup only type deals. 
Oh like yeah, all that's the other, what like all the other restaurants have done during COVID, they all have right, exactly. Spots. Yeah, I think Fred's right. I think once we get the, if we can get some paint striping down there, that people are going to see, like no parking yeah. in the alley and the signs. The shrub taken back would be huge. Do we have the ability to ask the owners to cut the shrub back? I, I don't know. I would assume so. It's in right away. Yeah, I think that that's probably something we could do. Okay. I think we have good ideas there. Anyone have anything else to add? We'll uh, try Fred's ideas and see if they work. Okay. What? Last thing we have on the agenda tonight is to talk about speed readout signs, uh, some placement options and a budget. So we've talked about this before and uh, you probably have even seen some pamphlets about the uh, signs. And we've queried, uh, the commission asked me to query our motorcycle officer, which has been done. And he gave his opinion on where he thought the biggest impacts could be made by some of these signs. So this first location uh, that is a recommended placement location is on Hoffman Road. Um, and I, I created this red line to indicate somewhere along here uh, would be a, an ideal preferred location where you enter the city and the speed limit is 35. Um, Matt went out and took a couple pictures today that I will show you now. Matt, you want to walk us through that? Okay. Well, the first one, just so I remembered which picture was where. Um, so that is the intersection of Gun Club and Hoffman. And then the next picture, that would be the 35 mile sign just east of Gun Club Road. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that that would be a prime spot to remove that sign and place the digital one there. I don't know about further to the west, just because <laughs> if and when that intersection does get rehabbed, I didn't want to pull it, move it, all that. But there's no trees right there because they've got ran over. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that would be the Hoffman and Gun Club one. And that is going to be just to the west of, is it Luke Street? I think that's the street. So it's between Luke and Gun Club Road. And then the next one. So we're looking at Main Street between somewhere around the River Road Bridge, City Hall, City Limits, somewhere in there. Thank goodness always in front of people. So that was the one that I was proposing, which is just north of the River Road Bridge. And we could remove that sign and put the digital on that and then place the population sign just below that. And those numbers are 14 inches, by the way. Oh, those numbers there? Yes, they're 14 inches. They're like 13 and three quarters, but it's hard to figure when I was holding a tape up there, but it was around 14 inches. So we're right between, I would probably go 15 and that was further south. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but that's in front of Mitch Fry's house. That was the only place south of River Road that I could see that people weren't really utilizing it for parking or anything like that. That It's across from that address. <laughs> gotcha. Um, real quick, let me go back to this. What... I'm not certain about removing the speed signs themselves. Okay. Um, I don't think our proposed electronic signs have a speed on them. And I think that we're required to have those designated speed signs. Okay. Do enforcement. So maybe we could put the speed signs somewhere in the vicinity still. Yeah. But yeah. I'm not certain of that. Further south of that, they might be possibly ran over because um, they have that kind of semi parking there or whatever they do there, I guess. 
Um, we could probably move it north about 60, 70 feet. There was another spot that it didn't look like these trees are going to knock it over. Um, that's doable there. Okay. Uh, comments on the locations that we're proposing? Well, I was going to say, just because I have an opinion, it sounds like on everything, but um, place on Gun Club seems like it, it's pretty far into the 35 mile an hour zone. Wouldn't it be better to put it towards where the 35 mile an hour zone starts? And then if we move the one by City Hall closer to City Hall, then we still have people not recognizing the speed limit until we get closer to City Hall. And then we still have people tend to slow down in front of City Hall anyway. So I think the 35 zone sign, I think. Is that one, yeah, is I, that I believe. One, third so. sign down there. I'm not sure what these two are, I don't remember. Um, but you can see there's three signs here, one, two, three. I think that's where it says 35 right there. So they would have been warned that it's a 35 and that's going eastbound before you get to gun club. And then as you pass gun club, I mean, this would be lit up by the time you got to gun club road um, because it would be seeing you already. Isn't that right, Matt? Yeah, that's about a hundred and uh, about a hundred to 125 feet east of the gun club intersection. Does that help, that, that help your, your comment? I have a question. Does it really? work on either direction? Or is it just one side? No. Okay. Does that I'm, just, I'm just thinking personally, it would help me at the beginning, then halfway through. I'm kind of with um, Council Member Roden on this one, um, where it kind of makes some sense to me to have these things approaching these intersections that we know we have trouble with. So people are going at a slower speed through the intersections. Um, you know, cause coming north on Corvallis road before you get to river road, it'd be nice to slow people down. So if there is a collision, they're going at a slower speed and same sort of, same sort of thing here. Um, but that's just, that's just my two cents. I think that that might actually be County out there. Is that correct? It is County. Does that prevent us from putting a sign right there, Matt? I honestly don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I didn't either. That's why I asked you. Uh, Mr. Pesmer, what do you think? Does that prevent us from putting a sign right there? <laughs> it, it does not prevent us from putting a sign there. I'm just not sure how long it would last unless we actually asked them and, and uh, had their permission. It is their responsibility for the roads and for the road safety. So we probably would want to coordinate that with them. But I, I tend to agree with uh, Council Roden and, and Fred that uh, if we have safety issues there, we might as well um, move it move it out before. So. Okay. And then let me go to the, the next uh, location and let's talk through that a little bit. So looking, so uh, Fred, this is kind of that Independence Way. I think we've passed Independence Way at this point or it's just yes. more left. Um, and this is all private residences along here. Um, and not in the city. This too is not city limits um, on this side of the road at all until you get to the bridge, the last house before you hit the bridge. That one's actually city limits, I think, but none of these are. So I don't know if that creates any kind of a problem with us trying to put a sign there um, to slow people down before they got to the bridge or not. But then once we're to the bridge, oh, sorry, went the wrong way. Once we're to the bridge, this is really the first location that would be reasonable for putting a sign. Um, and really traffic coming off the bridge wouldn't have accelerated most of the time beyond 30 at this moment. Uh, that's, that's that close to the bridge right now. Yeah. Okay. Do we have more of a safety concern when we are approaching the 30 mile an hour speed zone than when we are traveling from the opposite direction and we are going to a 20 mile an hour speed zone? Oh, this is heading to the 20. If, yeah, but if, if we have the sign at the other end. Oh, like in downtown? Yeah, well, uh, just north of downtown. 
I mean, I'm just wondering which area has the, the fastest moving traffic. So if we're going across the bridge, by the time we get to downtown, we should be 20. Mm -hmm. And this way we're going 30. Is this the area that has the biggest concern? Uh, between here and City Hall, I would say, is where we're trying to get them slowed down because that 20 um, designation at City Hall, basically, just before City Hall is often um, people are going a lot faster than 20 right there. Okay. So chief, when they're going, when they're going a lot faster, are they going, are they coming from Corvallis Road or are they coming off the bridge and going and accelerating? I couldn't tell you. Um, by, the, by the time you see them there, you don't know where they've come from. Yeah. When you, when you were doing the data reports, one of the data reports was once people got off the River Road Bridge and made that right, there was a lot of accidents happening there. But once they made that right, that they just gunned it till they got to the very first stop sign. But then it might not even be effective right here because we're still too close to the bridge. Right. Yeah, my experience is, is they, uh, they usually hit their brakes about halfway through City Hall, um, you know, trying to get slowed down for that 20 sign, uh, which I know is actually, I think, before that. But uh, yeah, they usually whip through past City Hall pretty fast and then actually slow down um, just right as they get to the end of City Hall coming into town. So, so I think- Put it closer to um, the south side of City Hall. Maybe. Yeah, we feel like the one, we have a portable one that we put there um, when weather is good and we feel like it's very effective. Mm -hmm. It slows people down well and it's right at the, the entrance to City Hall, the Southern entrance to City Hall. Um, so I think south of that location would be a good place to put it. Even if it shows your speed is, um, you know, over 20, you're, you're going to see the 20 sign right after you see your speed, if that makes sense. So I don't know if there was a good location in that zone, Matt, or not. I know you uh, were looking. I didn't, I didn't drive that far north. Um, well, I did, but I wasn't paying close attention. Uh, the other spot that I was looking at was about 100 and mm, it was just beyond that group of trees, probably 100, 150 feet that I looked at that was open and visible for people to see. I didn't pay much attention beyond that. I can. That'd be about where we're talking, like about where this these cars are here. Yes, oh, yeah, okay. and that was clear. Okay, that'd probably be the better spot then. And then would that be a 20 mile an hour warning or a 30 mile an hour? So it's not a warning. Um, it's just a, uh, a display of your speed. Um, and then you'd see the speed sign right after you saw what your speed was. Uh, I got a question. Are we still using the data collector? We have we have it sent in to try to be repaired. So no, they have not started working again. So what follows next is a couple of quotes on different sign options. Um, and the reason Matt was telling you what the height of the letters on the signs were, which he can repeat so that we're clear. <laughs> Uh, on what we're looking at. This 12 inch uh, indication on this sign is this, the height of the readout display, the actual numbers of the readout display. Um, and so we have two different quotes here um, of two different sizes. So a total of four quotes. One is for a 12 inch without many options. One is for a 12 inch with some extra options. And then we have a 15 inch. So walking through those, what this 12 inch doesn't have is um, some alert strobes, a simulated camera flash, and the ability to put up text if you wanted to. I don't think we need that, but I, it must have come in a package because the difference between not having those options and having those options is $695 for all three options as a package. Wow. So on a 12 inch sign, you're looking at 4625 with all the options and on a 15 inch side without is 4215 and with the options is 4910. So I don't know if we, I think that at that 20 zone where we're going down to a 20, a 12 inch sign would be plenty um, because your 30 signs were 13 inches you said roughly? Yeah, 13 and three quarter, almost 14. Okay. 
but but out on the other road when we're out on Hoffman and people are maybe going 40, I think the bigger one makes more sense personally. What was the what was the price difference between that and the 12 in the in the loaded ones? So uh, 49.10 versus 46.25. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the, I don't know, for the 200 and whatever dollars, I, I, I don't know. The whole purpose we're doing this is to catch people's attention. I don't know that for 200 and whatever dollars, I would go to the smaller sign, but that's my opinion. Yeah. Actually, I didn't realize they were that close. You're right. 46 and a quarter to 49.10. So. And we have um, mm -hmm. a budget of ten thousand dollars, which I think Pretty just with all the uh, required stuff to put it up, but it doesn't have any public works time to put it up. Uh, Mike, so what we actually use the uh, the red blue alert strobes in a residential area? So those came up and uh, someone else had seen them on the commission. I don't remember who it was, but at the first time we talked about these, they told us about these strobes and when you're going, you, they're adjustable. So if you're going, let's say it's a, you're about to go to that 20 mile an hour zone, you can set those strobes to flash and get their attention at a certain speed. So you can have a tolerance there. So say they're at 30 miles an hour, it may flash and make more, uh, um, grab their attention more, or there's a, that white is a simulated camera flash is what it's called on the uh, invoice. But I guess that one flashes, you know, like a, a bright strobe to get your attention um, until you slow down under the tolerance and then it would stop doing that. Are those directional as well? Or They're just going to be like in the sign, in the sign okay. where the, it's okay. part of the electronics of the readout is all it is. I know that when the uh, the white ones strobe, people think their picture got taken. We've had calls. On yeah. that they call to say, "Did you know? Are you guys doing photo radar there?" Because I wanted to know if I was going to get a ticket in the mail, kind of thing. And so, Monmouth has those ones. They have the strobe ones. Yes, the the white ones. Yeah. Okay. Effective. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> well, have yeah. you seen them flashing? Oh, I've seen them flashing. Yeah. So you were going too fast. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then that last option, I, again, it was just part of their uh, package, but it was, you could put text graphics up there. I don't know how easy it is to do it, but say there was some sort of um, emergency, um, you could put a message up there instead of having to read sign uh, speed at it. So. What are our thoughts? I don't know about the white strobe light, but something yellow to grab attention, maybe. I mean, I the white. I think the options the are white. white or red and blue. Well, red, I guess. But white, I mean, that could cause a medical emergency, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't seen it. I actually haven't seen it work. I would have to see it to know. I I tend to think that um, the bigger font is is the way we should go. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I almost think that we could go with the more bells and whistles for the Hoffman one, and maybe the one in the downtown have have less of those. Uh, bells and whistles i don't know um just as a way to sort of mitigate the cost to going with with the big the, with the bigger sign but that's just a thought that's a good thought i agree does, does anyone ever see a reason that we would use them to display text maybe during events like fourth of july and emergencies one, one thing to mention, though, I think in our previous conversations, um, Chief, that we were talking about possibly moving these around. Is, is that correct? And if that is, I don't know that we want to minimize 
future options. If we're going to move them, say, say downtown, we don't need the strobes, but if we move it and we're like, Oh shoot, we maybe should have, have got that. I mean, there may be an option that we don't use the strobes if it creates an issue downtown, but if we move it to another spot and don't have them, then what? Cause I, we, we were planning on moving them yearly or something. Is that correct? We did talk about that, that it was really um, because they have uh, solar and uh, they're allegedly they're pretty easy to install and move. We thought that it would be good to put them up for a period of time and kind of they also collect data um, within them. So yeah. put them up, see how they uh, work and whether or not they're functioning the way we hope they would slowing cars down and then uh, moving them to another place uh, around town. We did talk about that, Matt. You're right. That would be great. Okay, so I think we've got our first two spots. Um, I think at least one of them, we want to get the bells and whistles, and then I'll see if I can make a better deal with the uh, manufacturers and get them both fully loaded um, and stay within that original budget. Um, oftentimes, if you call and talk through them, they'll give you a better deal. So I'll try that too. Anything else? Everybody good on that? All right. Um, I think that was the end of our agenda. It was. Anyone have anything for the good of the order that they uh, were hoping to talk about? I have a few things to say. Um, Brad, if you need help uh, promoting the traffic um, survey or whatnot, I would love to help with that in any way I can. I know a lot of people in town, so I could get the word out maybe uh, to help. Okay. So if I can help in that way, that'd be great. And then the other thing is um, just to think about in the future, um, I'm really concerned about um, the traffic enforcement at the uh, new development in the downtown river front area where the people don't have adequate space in their driveway to park their cars. And I was just wondering if there's some way to um, amend the code or look at it, and I don't know the answer, to um, allow them to continue to park in their driveway, even if it covers up their sidewalk, you know, a few inches. So I, I went down there and I looked and it seemed like they were pretty close to the, their garage door and the tail of their vehicle still overhung the safety walkway a good bit. So I, I would just hate for us to add to our traffic problems by not allowing people to park in their own driveway. But I don't know if there's anything we can do. Well, um, I, I would say that if you wanted to actually take some sort of action that allowed it, it would be like to close the sidewalk because otherwise we would be opening the city up to liability when someone did go around it if the sidewalk were still open um, because that's the whole idea of a sidewalk, you know? Um, so I don't know, Mr. Pesimir, I see you came off mute. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that, you know, this is obviously a problem that the city was aware of and, um, you know, it, the, the challenge is, is those are not owners that are owned by individual uh, people and they're not their own lot. So um, it fell under, um, a site design criteria and the city pushed, you know, or recommended to the developer who actually is leasing those units that they actually push those back far enough to provide um, for uh, a driveway for vehicles to be able to park. Um, and ultimately the developer chose to um, have more of a backyard um, than to allow their uh, the renters to or lease uh, leasers to actually be able to park um, in front, and so that they would, uh, you know, um, encourage them to park inside the uh, uh, structure, um, the garage is provided for them. So that was something that you know um, certainly that the city was aware of, and we certainly made a recommendation. But I don't believe that we had code provisions that uh, allowed us to um, force that to happen. Um, and so it really became their choice uh, and, and, you know, to a certain extent, um, I feel for the people who are leasing from them, but that was the choice that their, um, their landlord made um, is to uh, create that issue. And so um, 
while I have sympathy for them, I, I really think that's partly a private um, issue uh, between the, the leaser and the, um, the landlord uh, who made that decision in order to create that situation, even though they were aware that it was going to happen. All right, I just wanted to give my two cents. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah, no, I hear you. <laughs> it was their choice, so. Anything else for the good of the order? All right, well, thank you all for your time. And I had uh, one text message sent to me for somebody that might have an interest in being on the commission. So I'll reach out to that person. If you have any other ideas, um, get those to Karen so that she can uh, share them with the mayor. And if that is all, we will adjourn 743. Thank you.